Well, hello, City Church. And hello to all those watching on the live stream, on YouTube, Facebook. Good to have you with us, as always. It's good to be one big family, lots of different countries and locations, and all coming together to celebrate and to unite around Jesus. This is a good thing. And happy holidays. This past week has been full of holidays, hasn't it? It's packed. It's uh, yeah, a celebration of our City Church 8th birthday party last week. Boom, give a big uh, clap to God for establishing us, giving us a birthday. And uh, are we able to check out a video from that? Are we able to show that at this moment? Way to go, you guys. Way to celebrate. And later in the week then, after the big celebration of our eighth birthday, we had a big holiday that is celebrated all around the world. And that, of course, was... Anyone, anyone? Did I hear someone say All Saints Day or Halloween? But there's another one in there. Anybody know what that other holiday was this past week, October 31st? I'll give you a clue. It was started in 1517. It was Reformation Day. Okay, not a lot of you were uh, celebrating that one. Maybe not a lot of you celebrate Reformation Day every year, but it's actually a day when October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther, a German Catholic priest, university professor, and theologian, sent his famous 95 theses, or, <coughs> excuse me, 95 disputations uh, to the Archbishop of Mainz, or uh, also reportedly nailed these 95 theses or disputations to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. And the collection of these theses, these disputations, was protesting against what Martin Luther saw as corruption and as unbiblical practices of the Catholic Church. And so that day is now celebrated, has been since then, considered to be the beginning of what is known as the Protestant Reformation. So it's Reformation Day and the birth of the Protestant Church. So we have received this inheritance in that we would be considered a Protestant church, protesting against those things that were considered by Martin Luther to be unbiblical, and he established a different way of doing things which grew and has become the Protestant church that we are part of today. So Luther was a rebel. Uh, he initiated great change in the landscape of religious belief, and we all are affected by that even today. And he championed the idea of salvation by faith alone, sola fide in Latin, as he called it. And that has become a significant distinctive of Protestant theology. So today we're going to talk about him and his core belief and a couple of other rebels that stirred things up and made an impact. And the first is a, name, a man by the name of William Wallace. You may be familiar with this name. He was a Scottish knight who became one of the primary leaders in the first war of Scottish independence. So has anybody seen the movie Braveheart? Uh, old movie, but uh, it's a pretty classic film. A lot of us have seen it, and it's his story. And in the movie, there's a famous scene where he rallies the Scottish forces that are vastly outnumbered by the British army, and he gives them a speech in which they're getting ready to, to run away and hide because there's no way we can beat these guys, so we just need to run away. And uh, he says, well, yeah, if you run away, you may live. If you fight, you may die. But if you live and you're hiding in your 
little room and dying someday on your bed, would you trade every day from then till now for one chance to go and say to our enemies, you can take away our lives, but you'll never take our freedom. And now if you go to that, uh, that picture from the, uh, from the Braveheart movie, he gets pretty passionate about this, and he stirs everybody up. And you know, I thought about painting my face blue for today's message um, in, in solidarity with William Wallace, but then I thought, nah, maybe not. Looks better on him. He'd probably all be scared and would run out of the room if I showed up like that. But he was a rebel with a cause, uh, fighting for freedom. The other rebel is the Apostle Paul, who has been our guide as we have been continuing our series called Good News, Looking at the Gospel the message that changed the world, that Paul had experienced changing his own life. And this message is still changing the world all around the world today. And it can change your life and turn your world upside down if you let it, if you believe it. And so Paul wrote a letter to the churches in the Roman province of Galatia presenting powerfully the content of this message, the gospel. This province is in modern-day Turkey, and we've been looking at this letter because it focuses on this message, because it powerfully presents the content of the gospel, that, that high explosive that had blown Paul's life up and put it back together again, and is doing that in people's lives all around the world ever since. It powerfully affected Martin Luther as well. As Martin Luther was strongly influenced in developing his core belief, especially about justification by faith, being declared right with God, by God, by faith, faith alone, sola fide. He developed that by reading and studying Paul's letter to the Galatians and his letter to the Romans and some of the other letters. It's a world-changing, life-transforming message that we're digging into today. So let's dig in. Let's look at it. The core beliefs of these three men actually come together and intertwine in this message today. I've entitled the message, Freedom, Faith, and Love. Those are the three core beliefs, and those are presented powerfully in the verses that Paul is going to be sharing with us today. Because I believe that everyone can live a life of, as Paul described it, the glorious freedom of the sons and daughters of God. We can live that life of freedom as we walk by faith and as we express our faith through love. So these three concepts are going to be knit together by Paul. Wallace's idea, his core value of freedom. Luther's idea, his core value of faith, salvation by faith alone. And together with Jesus' value of love. So let's dive in and explore this. And I actually think that William Wallace and the Apostle Paul would have been good friends if they'd lived at the same time period. They were buddies. They, they got each other. They had the same passion and the same value of significant concepts. Now, in the movie, Braveheart, as William Wallace is being cruelly executed and he's dying, his last word is to cry out, Freedom! And his last breath he expresses that. That was his core value. And he lived and died for it. And as Paul begins chapter 5 of Galatians, his letter to the Galatians, he takes up the same rallying cry. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. 
And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I can imagine Wallace saying something similar. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened by a yoke of slavery. That's something like how he would have pronounced it. But Paul was passionate about this, just as Wallace was. Paul powerfully presented this gospel, the message of God's love that he had received from Jesus himself. He presented this message to the people in Galatia. He told them about how Jesus, who's God himself, did not hold on to his prerogatives, his privileges as God, but emptied himself, allowing himself to become a human being, to be limited to one place and one time. Why? To be among us, to live with us, to show us what God is like, so that we could hear him and we could see him. His disciples could touch him, could walk with him, could live with him and learn how to relate to God. So he came to show us what God is like and to make a way for us to be restored into a loving relationship with God because he knew that all humans have a problem. All of us have a problem. We're separated from God. Sin separates us from God. Sin is turning our backs on God and walking away from Him. And that separation that we bring is spiritual death because we're separated from the source of life, God Himself, the source of all life. We distance ourselves from that and turn away. And we can't overcome that problem in our own strength. We can't do enough good things to make it better. We are spiritually dead. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But God's not willing to let us stay there. He loves us. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus came and died on the cross, cruelly executed. You can understand what Wallace experienced. Jesus was executed in an even more cruel way. And in that dying, he took our sin on himself, paying for it and burying it with him in the grave. And his last word, as he's dying on the cross, was, it's finished. Tetelestai. The price is paid. And that means we get freedom. We get to go free. We get our sins taken away. We get to have eternal life because Jesus paid for it and gave it to us. Because Jesus didn't just stay dead. He rose again from the dead. God raised him from the dead. He became alive again. And he left our sin there in the grave. And he left it paid for, forgiven, erased. That's God's grace. And when we believe this message by faith then we rise into new life in him. We are forgiven. We are able to enter into a loving relationship with God because there's no sin in the way. There's no separation anymore. We can turn to God by faith and have intimate relationship with him because he adopts us into his family. We are born again into new life. We become children of God. This is good news. This is the good news. This is the gospel. And the Galatians heard this message. They believed it. They responded to it. They accepted it by faith. And they were baptized. And they became part of new communities called churches scattered throughout Galatia. 
And they were following Jesus together and growing in the grace and the love of God. This is good, good stuff. This is shouting stuff. But then things went south. And a group of religious legalists known as the Judaizers came behind after Paul had left and taught the people, no, 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 faith isn't enough. No, no, no. Faith in Jesus doesn't cut it. No, if you want to be real Christians, you have to add to your faith a whole lot of works. For the first thing, you need to be circumcised as an adult. I don't even want to think about that as it's a surgical procedure on a very sensitive part of the male anatomy. This is not good. But this is just one of all these laws that you have to keep, all the laws of Judaism. And they had added hundreds of extra laws onto the law of Moses. And now there were 600 plus laws that people had to keep. And they said, yeah, you got to do this if you want to be a good Christian. Ooh, Paul got really worked up about this. He was like, no, it's not about keeping a long list of laws. It's about faith in Jesus. Paul had been a religious legalist. He had been set free from all this by Jesus himself. And in chapter 5, we get to see Paul when he's really angry. If you want to see smoke coming out of Paul's ears and his face turn bright red, this is it. He continues in Galatians 5, he says, Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, if you submit to all these, this huge long list of rules and regulations, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare, he repeats himself, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he's obligated to obey the whole law. You've got to keep all 600 of them, plus you can't pick and choose. Paul is steamed. This is antithetical to the gospel he preaches. <laughs> and he gets so angry that he says later in the chapter, as for those agitators, the Judaizers, the ones saying you have to be circumcised, I wish that they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Ouch. Really? That's in the Bible? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, Paul gets angry, especially when you start messing with his kids in the faith. Those baby Christians were vulnerable, like little lambs. And Paul, in another book, another letter, describes the Judaizers as ravening wolves, attacking the flock, destroying, ruining their faith. And you know what? Jesus gets angry too about this very same thing. When Jesus was talking to the religious uh, legalists, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, he had some harsh words for them. He said, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs, which look good on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead man's bones and all filth. Ooh, like he goes on. He also called them snakes, blind fools, children of hell. Jesus was intense about this. Jesus was passionate about it too. He did not want to see this being propagated, being taught, when it's really all about following him, faith in him. But you know what? Jesus was also sad about it. And in that same passage where he expresses his anger at the religious legalists, he goes on to say at the end, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I've longed to gather your children together like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not have it. You are not willing. You're not willing to come to me, into that relationship 
come under my arms, gather around me, huddle close for warmth and safety and love. That's what I want to give to you. That's what Paul had understood. That's what informed his gospel as he was presenting it. And so similarly, Paul says with sadness in his voice, as he continues in Galatians 5, you who are trying to be justified by the law, trying to be declared righteous by God by keeping the rules of the law, you've been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Trying to earn God's favor by good works is slavery, Paul says. People, you're working too hard. Jesus has already done the hard work on the cross. Our job is to receive it by faith, to trust in what he has done. That's God's provision for us by grace. Don't be burdened again by a yoke of slavery, Paul says. The word burdened is to be entangled and tied up and confined. Don't give up. As Wallace might say, don't give up on your freedom. And that's where faith comes in. Paul says, as he continues in Galatians 5, for through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The righteousness means a right relationship with God. That's what Jesus does for us as he dies on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, forgiving us, getting it out of the way so we are restored into right relationship with God. That gives us righteousness. Eventually, when we meet God face to face in heaven, we will receive his final verdict of not guilty, forgiven of our sins forever because of our faith in Jesus and what he has done for us on the cross. That's what Paul means by the righteousness for which we hope. But until then, we have the same assurance of our right relationship with God in the same way, by faith. And the Holy Spirit guides us to embrace that truth. Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will take from what is mine and he will make it known to you. He will guide you into all the truth. So we can embrace this and we can live by it. So that's what Martin Luther discovered. When he read Paul's letter to the Galatians, like we're reading now, and the other letters that Paul wrote, such as to the Romans and the Hebrews, he came to believe firmly, so strongly, that justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ's righteousness alone, is the gospel, the core of the Christian faith. You know, Paul helped Luther to understand and to develop this principle, which Luther called sola fide, by faith alone. And he said, that is why faith alone makes someone just and fulfills the law. Faith is that which brings the Holy Spirit through the merits of Christ. So faith for Luther was a gift from God. And as he said, it's a living, bold trust in God's grace, so certain of God's favor that it would risk death a thousand times trusting it. That's faith. And Luther did risk his life trusting in this. This was not popular when he was promoting this uh, idea. He was brought on trial. He was tried for heresy. He was condemned 
he was excommunicated from the church. He was hunted, threatened. He had to, to hide in a castle to, to save his, his own life. But Luther also said, and this is what he believed and lived for, he said, all have sinned and are justified freely without their own works and merits by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, in his blood. This is necessary to believe. This cannot be otherwise acquired or grasped by any work, law, or merit. Therefore, it is clear and certain that this faith alone justifies us, makes us right with God, enables us to be declared righteous by God, not guilty, forgiven, nothing between us and God, so we can be in intimate relationship with him. So Luther risked his life to promote this message of the gospel, as Paul did. And what does it look like when this gospel is lived out, is truly believed and accessed and becomes core in our being? Our faith expresses itself through love. It all comes back to love. Both Luther and Paul would agree with this and with the idea that the ultimate example of this, this message in action, is Jesus. Jesus exemplified the core value of love. So Paul wrote as he continues in Galatians 5, he said, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, the sinful nature, the temptations that come around to us to satisfy our selfish desires in, in ways that hurt us and others. He says, no, rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love, love your neighbor as yourself. So what does righteousness look like? What is the result of right relationship with God? It's a life of love. We look like Jesus, the ultimate example of love. And Jesus also shows us this intersection between freedom and faith and love coming together. As Paul describes it, Jesus was truly free. He lived his life by faith. He said, I do nothing but what my Father tells me to do. And he expressed it through love. <coughs> Paul says that we were called to be free. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And William Wallace would agree. <laughs> he didn't say that. The Bible did. Paul did. But he would agree. He was passionate about this, and Jesus' life and Paul's writing teaches us that we don't express our freedom by indulging our sinful nature, by doing whatever we feel like. It's not freedom to do anything I want. It's freedom from the control of the sinful nature, which tempts us and lures us and impels us to go after things that are not good for us, that will hurt us and that will hurt others. So we turn our back on God and we go after that sin. And God calls us, no, don't go there. Turn away from sin, which is what repentance means. Repent and turn to God that your sins may be washed away by faith in what Jesus has done on the cross. So instead of gratifying our selfish desires, we can serve one another in love. We can serve God humbly. And that's the example of Jesus too. Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's our example. That's 
the life of following Jesus is expressing love, expressing our faith through love. And when they ask Jesus, what is the most important thing? What is most important to you? Jesus summed it up beautifully in one word, love. Matthew 22, they asked him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, now that's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He sums it up. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. When we love, we fulfilled the law, which is what Jesus came to do, to show us what the law was really about. It's really about love. It's really about how do we love God and love people. When we love, we fulfilled the law, and we never have to worry about, have I done enough? That's never a question that the Christian has to ask, ever, because Jesus shows us that if you're worrying about that, you're working too hard. You need to learn to receive, by grace, through faith, the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He paid for it on the cross. We don't have to dig into our pockets to pay for it now with our good works. We can't. He already did it. That's what tetelestai, the last word that Jesus said on the cross, means paid in full. It's already covered. The bill is paid. We can't add anything to it. We can't add anything to what Jesus has already done for us. Our good works don't make it happen. We can enter into the glorious freedom of the sons and daughters of God. That is what we are. You're a kid of the king. Do you know that? You're a prince or princess in the kingdom of God, possessing royal rights and privileges, not like earthly kings and royal families who get prideful and puffed up and have lots of money and keep it to themselves, but as kids of the king of kings, Jesus who demonstrated how to live humbly, serving others, to live a life of love, to give it away. That's what we do when we go to do Smile Warsaw. That's what we do when we are doing these service roles like the Set Up and Tear Down team, like the multimedia team and the sound team, like the kids' ministry, like the hospitality team. We're living humbly. We're serving others we're expressing faith through love. So let God set you free by trusting the message of the gospel and receiving the love of God and expressing it by reflecting it back to him and by paying it forward into the lives of others. Not to gain acceptance with God. You already have it by faith in Jesus and what he's done on the cross. But out of your already achieved acceptance with God, thankful, saying, wow, what a great salvation, God. What a great God you are. What can I do for you? How can I follow you today? What do you want to do together with me today? That's the life of love. That's freedom, faith, and love coming together. So let's have the worship team come up now and give us an opportunity to express our love for God through musical worship. And as they're coming, let me pray for us. Yeah, God, we, we acknowledge that we need you. We are completely and utterly dependent on you for this. We can't earn it by our works. We can't do enough good stuff to outweigh the bad. We can't earn your favor. And we don't need to. We're so thankful that we don't need to. 
because you offer it to us as a gift. What we earn by our sin is death, separation from you. We've turned our backs on you and walked away. But what you continue to offer with your arms open wide to us is the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Thank you that that gift is never rescinded, that your arms are always open wide, that you are there. And as we repent, as we turn away from sin and turn back to you, you are there with your arms open, waiting to embrace us. Thank you. You are such a good God. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Thank you for providing salvation for us that we can receive by faith. And we just express that. We express our faith through love now as we love you through these worship songs. Glory to your name, God. You deserve it. You are worthy. Amen. Amen. We invite you to stand with us if you are able to and to join in as we worship this great God.